The Pasuk in Bereshis tells us that when the Malachim came dressed up as men, Avram Avinu didn't recognize them as anything but important individuals. As a matter of fact, it wasn't even clear that he recognized them as specifically dignified people. According to some Rishonim, he thought they were simple Arabs. He bows down, please do not pass, please come join me, <coughs> come to my tent. And the Psukim are very specific and very elaborate in terms of exactly what he did. He runs to Sora and says, quickly prepare three separate cows, prepare some bread. Then Avram runs to the bucker, he runs to the calves, he shechs three separate calves. He then takes butter, he takes milk, and he takes the meat and he stands over these people and serves them. Those specific details came back in a very important conversation some 400 years later. And that conversation was when Moshe Rabbeinu went, went up to be Mechabal the Torah. And this was to be the moment of transition when the Jewish nation was to become the Am HaNifchar. And the Torah was to be given to them. And as Moshe Rabbeinu approaches the Kisya Kovl, the Malachi Asharis attempted to kill him. Not only wouldn't they allow Moshe Rabbeinu to receive the Torah, they attempted with everything in their power to block that event from happening. And the reason they attempted to stop it was because up until that moment, the Malachim were responsible for the learning of Torah. Just like there's a physicality to this world, there's a spiritual dimension to it. And that spiritual dimension needs constant nourishment, constant energizing. The process of learning Torah infuses the world with that necessary energy. Up until that moment, the Malachim were the ones who were responsible for it. Malachim were reliable. <clears throat> Malachim knew that they were dependable. But they were very much afraid that if the Torah is taken from Shemayim, and taken from heaven and now given to man, if man learns the Torah, Matov Manayim, it's wonderful. But if man doesn't, then it spells the destruction of the universe, the cosmos, all of existence. And therefore the Malachim did not want to allow Moshe Rabbeinu to receive the Torah. And there was at that point a vikuah, there was actually a debate, where Hashem said to Moshe, say to them an answer. Tell them why in fact you should receive the Torah. And the main thrust of Moshe Rabbeinu's argument was quite simple. Weren't you there? Weren't there three angels who ate the bucker, who ate the meat and the milk together? Quoting this event from Avram Avinu. And Das the Canaan on that Pasuk tells us, Miyad Hodu, instantly. The Malachim agreed, they said, you're right. And they allowed Moshe Rabbeinu to come forward and receive the Torah. And that is the Medrash as brought by the Dance of Canaan. And the question on that Medrash, I believe, is quite obvious. And the question really begins as follows. The Malachim had a clear reason why they didn't want man to have the Torah. What exactly did Moshe Rabbeinu say that was so compelling, such a powerful argument, that they immediately were moda? Number one, all Moshe said was that three Malachim ate Basavachal. Three Malachim apparently were eating meat and milk together. And let's even grant that it's forbidden for a Malach to eat meat and milk together. It was just three out of, I don't know, millions if not billions of angels. That's question number one. Question number two is that event happened more than 400 years earlier. So what the three lone angels sinned some 400 years earlier, therefore they're not worthy of keeping the Torah? But what makes this question even more profound is if in fact any time that one who learns the Torah sins, then I dare say we're in a lot of trouble. Because there is no such entity as a human who doesn't sin. And the fact that three Malachim one time sinned some 400 years ago seems like a rather uncompelling, rather inconclusive reason for the Malachim not to keep the Torah. So the question to me is what does the Das Kenyan mean when he says that Miyad Hodu, as soon as they heard those words, the Malachim said, you're right, the Torah is not for us, and the Torah is for man. And to understand the answer to this, I believe we have to understand something very fundamental to the human. And that is, we human beings are in constant contradiction. We are a living, walking contradiction. And the minute you start studying yourself, the minute you start observing your own behavior, you'll quickly see that you're comprised of many different elements, 
many competing parts and the human as I exist am actually very much in stir in contradiction. And the Chobos of Ovas explains to us that that is not by accident. He actually explains that when Hashem created the human, Hashem made the human out of two very diverse, distinct parts. A nefesh sikhli and a nefesh bahami. The nefesh sikhli is the intellectual part of man that is the seichel that came from under the kisei kovod. that is a part of me that clearly sees truth, that's a part of me that wants to cling to Hashem, that's a part of me that wants to be generous, magnanimous, giving, and caring. That is a full half of me. But there's another half of me that has nothing to do with that. There's another half of me that is completely base instincts, desires, passions, drives. That other half of me is what we call the nefesh bahami, the animal instinct of man. Now, Western man takes this concept a bit too far, but the reality is that an animal has a nefesh, not a ruach, not an ashama, but a nefesh. A nefesh means <clears throat> almost a personality. Definitely instincts, desires, proclivities. The robin naturally hungers for the worm. The bullfrog naturally desires to live in the way that it lives. Each animal has a very distinct nature, but not just in terms of instincts and drives. We had, a, <clears throat> there was a fellow who was in yeshiva, this was a dorm yeshiva, and when he was a little boy, his parents bought him a puppy. And the little boy and the puppy grew up together. And when he turned now some 13 or 14 years of age, he went off to Yeshiva High School. And he and the now grown dog separated. They had been together for many, many years. And apparently the separation was much harder on the dog than it was on this fellow. Every out Shabbos, every six to eight weeks when this fellow would go home, he had a problem with his dog. Why? because he would get off the bus and his dog would be waiting there in the yard and his dog would see its master that it hadn't seen in six weeks and it would run up and in, in its excitement it would relieve itself over the pants legs of its master. And that became rather this issue for him but the point being there's a personality, there's a nature, there's a nefesh to the dog. The dog has something of a personality. Within each of the animals Hashem implanted all of the instincts, all of the desires, and all of the needs that it requires for its remaining in existence and the species as a whole. And they've studied different species and they find all of the instincts that it needs inborn, right at birth, within its very nature. Now let's understand, it's not seichel, it's not intellect. The robin does not say, hmm, based on the availability as well as the nutritional value, I believe it is appropriate for me to hunt the worm. The robin naturally, instinctually hungers for the worm. Two bullfrogs don't sit down and say, sit on a leaf and say one night, you know, it's time for us to settle down and raise a family. All of the drives, all of the instincts, all of the needs for the continuation of that individual animal, as well as the species as a whole, are implanted within it, and naturally it desires what it requires. Oftentimes, it's very interesting to note the sophistication of the animal in fulfilling its needs. In the winter, that brown bear will turn ravenous. It'll sit in that tree or its cave for months on end. For those months, what it's living on is the fat that it's stored up in the, in the months of July and August, and during the months of July and August, it has a natural hunger. It has an amazing, compelling hunger. It's ravenous during those months, and it adds up to 20% of its body weight during those times. The bear is unaware of a winter. The bear doesn't say to itself, gee golly, there's not going to be any berries to eat. The bear naturally, in the summer months, hungers. The bear naturally has the instincts for its continuation, for all that it needs. And each animal was given all of the instincts and that it needs for its continuation and the continuation of the species. So too in Odom, so too in man. Man was given all of the instincts that he needs to continue himself and to continue the race called the human race. And what that means is instinctually the man has all of the appetites, desires, and needs that he has for his continuation contained within the nefesh habahami. There was an article in National Geographic, I quoted it in a schmooze once, and bears repeating, 
two biologists had discovered Siberian tigers orphaned at birth. And these two tigers, they, the biologists discovered the mother was dead, so they basically brought it up on bottled milk. They fed the cubs, they took care of the cubs, and they quickly realized that there was nothing that they could do to train the cubs to live in the wild. But as the cubs grew and they were no longer fit to be fed milk, the biologists took a chance and they said, we have nothing, no other choice other than to release them. And they did it as a study to see what would happen. Biologists released them in the wild and they watched them. Almost from the moment they were released, these two Siberian cubs, now grown up, began hunting, tracking, and knew how to take down the deer, their natural food source. They knew exactly how to lay in wait. They knew exactly how to pounce. They knew exactly how to take down the deer, deer, how to kill it. And they knew which parts to eat first. No mother around to teach it. No one to train it. Instinctually, within the nephesh of that Siberian tiger, there's all of the instincts it needs for its survival, and so too Adam. Man has all of the instincts, all of the needs, all of the desires to keep himself alive and keep himself well. Sometimes those desires are not things we're happy with. Sometimes they work against us. When my wife had our first child, she went on what I call the sit diet. Now many women are on this sit diet. The sit diet, which actually is Rosh Hashanah's for self-inflicted torture, and the sit diet sounds something like this. You take a very large wedge of chocolate cake, a diet coke in the other hand, and you say the following words, I'm so fat, I'm so fat, I'm so fat, you eat the full piece of cake, and you continue that sit diet. And I said to my wife at a certain point, listen, you had a baby, if you wish to stay at your current weight, I'm fine with that. If you wish to lose weight, I'm fine with that also. But no self-inflicted torture. If you're bothered by your weight, we do something about it. If you decide it's not important enough to you, so live with it. But this self-inflicted torture stuff helps no one. At the end of the day, it got to the point where I actually said to my wife, that's it. And I took her by the hand to Weight Watchers, and then we sat at a Weight Watchers meeting. For me, as a bocher in yeshiva for many years, this was my first experience at such a meeting. And to be honest with you, a little bit of the meeting kind of blew me away. The part that particularly caught me was the fact that the meeting surrounded the weakness of the human. Because the leader would gather everybody together, and the leader would begin something like, okay, who can tell me what problems they had today, this week? And then each person would go through their week. My week was really good until somebody came out with the potato chips. Oh, the potato chips, another woman would say. My week was great until somebody brought out a chocolate bar. Oh, yeah, chocolate bar is my weakness. And I watched these people break down in front of my eyes. And that was when I came to a very core understanding. That is the human. If you ask this woman, would you like to decrease your appetite? Of course I don't want that appetite. So why don't you just not eat? And the answer is, I want to eat, but I don't want to eat. I very much hunger for that chocolate cake, but I don't want to eat that chocolate cake. That, my friends, is the human. Desire, knowledge that it might not be so good for me. I still hunger for it, but I don't really want it. That contradiction is the human. And if you ever wonder how it is that we're so flaky, one minute I could be the nicest, kindest guy on the planet. Catch me in the wrong mood if I'm cranky, and I'll snap. And I'll say things that embarrasses myself. And I can't believe I react that way. But I'm the same person who 10 minutes earlier was nice, sweet, kind, and caring. What am I, a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? And the answer is 100%. Within me, there are different parts, different components. There's a part of me that wants to be generous, kind, and giving. And there's a part of me that couldn't care less about anybody but myself. And there's a part of me that's filled with cuss, with anger that you tick off and just explodes with anger. And there's a part of me that looks at that individual and says, what are you doing? How could you speak that way? And the I that I'm speaking to you, I'm in constant contradiction. <clears throat> Two different parts, a nefesh sikhli, a nefesh bahami. And then the great secret the Chobaz always tells us is that the two parts are competing, always in flux, one or the other becoming primary. 
either the nefesh bahami becomes stronger and stronger and the nefesh sikhli becomes weaker, or the intellect of man, the neshama man becomes stronger and more dominant, and the animalistic desires become weaker. The human never remains where he is. One or the other gains primacy, and everything that we do either strengthens the physicality, the nefesh bahami, or strengthens the nefesh sikhli. And once you understand that, and you study other people, and spend a lot of time studying the other guy, you can begin appreciating how contradictory he is, and you can begin understanding how much it functions within him, and then you could do that most difficult job of applying it back to me, and seeing those very same contradictions, the same Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde within myself, and then you could begin understanding the human. And then you're ready for the key question, and that is, why is it so hard? Why did Hashem make it so difficult? Why can't I just say no and no longer desire the chocolate cake? Why can't I just shut off the taiva, shut off the desire, be in total control and be done with it? Why do I need this constant conflict, this constant com- competition of the parts, needing it and not needing it, wanting it and not wanting it? What do I need this constant conflict for? And the answer to this question is predicated on a mistake that many people make. I'm sure you've heard from the time you were a little boy in Cheder that Malachim, an angel, doesn't have Bechira. An angel doesn't have free will. That's a known given fact. It is my contention that not only is that not accurate, it's dead wrong. Because Malachim have Bechira. And I'll show you a classic case in point. And the Pasuk tells us that when Hashem sent the Malachim to save Lot, the Malachim told Lot, we are here to destroy the city, and if you do not escape, you will be killed with the entire city of Sodom. And at which point Stone, Lot agreed, and he left. The Dasakanim on that Pasuk tells us that those Malachim actually transgressed and went beyond what they were supposed to do. They were not told, nor, nor was it appropriate for them to tell Lot why they were there. Hashem sent them to take Lot out, and they made a cheshbon. If we tell Lot we're here to take him out, but we don't mention to him that we're also here to destroy Sodom, he's not going to listen to us. Therefore, they revealed Hashem's secret. Hashem did not ask them to say that they're there to destroy Sodom. They made a cheshbon. If we don't tell him, he won't leave. But because they revealed the secret of Hashem, and as the Canaan tells us, they were sent out of the Mechitz of Hashem for 135 years. They were sent into exile. They were punished for it. And you have to say to yourself, what does that mean? A Malach did something that Hashem told it not to do. A Malach did something wrong, and a Malach was punished. I thought Malachim don't have free will. But my friends, the Yesod is that any intellectual Bria, and any Bria that Hashem created has free will. All of the Kochavim, all of the celestial beings, as we've discussed previously, as well as certainly each Malach has Bechira, has free will, and has the ability not to do what Hashem wants. But the ability not to do what Hashem wants and the practical not doing it are two very different things. And I once mentioned this before, but it bears repeating. When I would teach high school, Musser, one of the first questions I, I would ask the fellows is, do I have free will to put my hand in a fire? And typically the way I illustrate this point is I'd pull out a $100 bill, if I was lucky enough to have one of those, and I would hold it up and say, okay guys, here's the deal. I will offer you $100 if you'll put your hand in a fire for a minute. Now this was high school and I had to be a little careful because the guys would take me, so, Rebbe, you really mean it? Is that a real 100 A minute? You're short in 60 seconds? But the bottom line is, if you think about it, there is no sane human being who would put his hand in a fire for a minute for $100. Why? Because it's dumb. It's self-inflicted damage. It hurts. It burns. It's just not worth the money. It's a stupid thing to do. Hence, we would never do it. Do you have free will to put your hand in a fire? In theory, you do. Objectively, you do. But practically, you don't. Why? Because you're not going to do it. It's stupid. It's self-inflicted damage. You would never do it. When we say a malach doesn't have bechira, a malach has free will. The distinction between man and an angel is that the angel has a clarity of thought. 
a very, very clear understanding of things, so clear that it understands that everything that Hashem commanded it to do is for its good. Any Aveira that Hashem said to the Malach not to do, the Malach understands is damaging to it. Any Mitzvah that Hashem says to do, the Malach appreciates is good for it. Hence, the Malach has free will in the sense that it theoretically could violate the will of Hashem, but it sees how foolish it is, <coughs> isn't tempted, and therefore on a practical level does not really have Bechira. And that is the distinction between a Malach and man. Man, in this mixed up state, with two separate nefoshos, a nefesh bahami, a nefesh sikhli, wanting to eat that chocolate cake, but not wanting to, desiring things, and then asking myself, why in the world do I desire those things? Finding myself in complete, utter conflict has practical bechira. Practical bechira, because when I wake up in the morning, I really, really want that, and I really, really don't. I need it, I crave it, I desire it, and I also know I shouldn't be doing it. That conflict, that stira within me, is what allows for real Bechira. Because now when I choose, it's not a theoretical choice, it's not so clear to me, and even though I know Hashem says don't do it, but I need it, I desire it, I hunger for it, and when I resist, then I'm given credit, and then I'm given schar, and ultimately that's the way the human shapes himself, that's the way the human forms himself. And, and my friends, that is the answer for the Malachim. Would you like to know exactly what Moshe said to Malachim? You Malachim ate basar v'cholov. It says in the Torah not to eat meat cooked together with milk. And why did you do it? The reason you did it was very simple. Because there's nothing wrong with you doing that. You see, meat mixed with milk is something that's forbidden for man. And that's something that's damaging to man. And that's something that strengthens the nefesh bahami in a very powerful way. That which is damaging to man, man can't do, but you can do. And the Chobot of explains to us, he says, if you study many of the Isurim in the Torah, until you understand this principle, they make no sense. Take 100% kosher milk, 100% kosher meat. You eat the milk, it's fine. You eat the meat, it's fine. Cook them together, and it's an isadoraisa. Makes no sense. Take wool, 100% fine wool, make a garment out of it, fine and dandy. Take linen, perfect garment. Mix them together, it's shot in this and it's forbidden. And Chobos of Alba says, would you like to know why the Torah forbids these things? It's not by accident, and not because Hashem is making up arbitrary rules. And Chobos of Alba explains that you and I are in constant battle. The Nevesha Bahami and the Nevesha Sikhli are fighting. They're competing forces, they're fighting against one another. And whichever one you strengthen becomes primary, becomes stronger. The more you give in to the Nefesh Bahami, the stronger it becomes. The more you give in to the Nefesh Sikhli, the stronger it becomes. And the question you have to ask yourself is which, which action strengthens which part? And the Chobos of Olves explains to us that almost everything we do during the course of our day strengthens the Nefesh Bahami. You see, the animal desires of man are what Hashem gave us to keep us in existence. Like the cow, like the bullfrog, like the robin, like the cheetah, who has all of the instincts necessary for its survival and the survival of the species, so too do I have those instincts. And what that means is, when I eat, when I work, when I go through all of the activities that I live with during the day, I'm acting and being driven by the Nefesh of Bahami, and everything that I do strengthens the animal soul of man, and if left in that state, the animal soul, the Nefesh of Bahami, would become stronger and stronger, and the Nefesh of Sikhli would become weaker and weaker. What strengthens the Nefesh of Sikhli? Very little. Davening, learning Torah, giving Siddhaka, Chesed, but the vast majority of our day is spent strengthening the Nefesh of Bahami, and not giving much attention to Nevesh uh, <coughs> Sikhli. Hence, the balance should be very quickly out of whack, and we should be in deep trouble. It says the Chobos of Olves as follows. The Torah warns us against certain activities that give a very, very powerful advantage to the Nefesh Bahami. The Torah says if you take meat, cook it together with milk, 
that has a power, that is a spiritual force that gives an inordinate amount of power to the nefesh habahami and strengthens it and makes the nefesh sickly much, much weaker. Shatan is, although to you and I may not seem any different than any other garment, it has a certain power. When you wear that garment, you can't daven the same way because it strengthens the nefesh habahami. You and I are not scientists of the soul. We can't quite perceive how it functions. And in that sense, it's called a chok. It's called a chok in the sense that understanding how it strengthens the nefesh of Bahami is difficult for us to understand. But the Chovos of Ovas says that's exactly what it does. And he says, so too the Be'ilos Asuros, the forbidden relations. When the Torah says a man is forbidden to live with his wife when she is a nida, if a man does that, it strengthens the nefesh of Bahami in a very, very strong, unusual way. What strengthens the nefesh of Sikhli? Very, very little. The most potent, powerful force that ultimately strengthens the nefesh of Sikhli is Limerat Torah. That is the one fuel, the one superpower that we have, and this is exactly what Moshe Rabbeinu was saying to the Malachim. Malach, why is it that you ate Basa B'cholov? Only for one reason. If it were damaging to you, you never would have done it. The reason why you ate Basa B'cholov was because it's not damaging to you. And you know why it's not damaging to you? Because you do not have a goof. You're a seichel, you're a complete neshama in that sense. You have no physicality, and there are no two parts to you. Hence, for you to eat Basa B'cholov doesn't damage you. There's no prohibition against a malach eating basa b'cholov because he doesn't have a nefesh of Bahami that becomes strengthened by doing it. Hence, there's no damage. Hence, the malachim did it. And what Moshe Rabbeinu was saying was not that you sinned, not that three you sinned, not that you sinned 400 years ago, but rather it reveals that the Torah is not for you. I study all of the mitzvahs of the Torah. They were written for man. Man, this Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, this person in conflict, this human who's constantly having two sides to him, one pulling this way, one pulling that way, the human who's in constant contradiction, the prohibitions of the Torah are specific to allow man's nefesh sikhli to become stronger, to stop his nefesh bahami from becoming too strong, and that's exactly what Moshe Rabbeinu said to the Malachim, miyad hodu, immediately they admitted. It's true. They never would have eaten that had it, they seen it as damaging. They ate it because it was not damaging, which effectively means the Torah is not for them. Now, my friends, this principle is very basic, but very significant for understanding all of the Torah. On one level, simply understanding Macholos Asuras, as we've discussed before, and understanding forbidden foods. What's wrong with eating an animal that's not properly shechted? What's wrong is it's metam tam alev, it deadens the heart. It's like taking Novocaine and inserting a needle directly into your heart. Your heart is deadened. You don't daven the same way. You don't feel Hashem's presence the same way. You don't feel Shabbos the same way because you've strengthened the nefesh of Bahami. If we don't understand it, Hashem does. The Torah writes clearly what's damaging and tells us to avoid it. And many, if not most, of the Isurim in the Torah circle around this concept. And when you begin understanding this, you can begin understanding much of the mitzvahs in the Torah, and you could also begin understanding much of the work that we have ahead of us. And I'll give you one good example that I think really brings this point out. The next time you wake up on Yom Kippur, say to yourself as follows, Gee golly, this does not make sense. The most holy day of the entire year. The one day when I have the opportunity to get rid of so much and so many sins I can clean up from. The one day where I have a chance to reach out to Hashem and daven and make so many requests. It's now 2 o'clock in the afternoon and I'm hungry, I'm tired, I'm weak. Why don't we have three good meals on that day? breakfast, lunch, and supper. I'll have much more energy, much more power. I'll be able to daven like a minch. I'll be able to really reach out to Hashem. Wouldn't it have made much more sense to have made three big sudas on the day of Yom Kippur? And the Chobos of Office explains that that's exactly the point. And you see, when you start Kol Nidre with a full belly, it's very difficult to really feel Hashem's presence because the nefesh of Bahami is very strong. And I don't just mean in the sense that you're full and you have a sense of arrogance. There's a strength to the nefesh of Bahami. 
When you get up in the morning and you're a little bit hungry, and as the day begins wearing on and your body becomes weaker, that's the chance for your nefesh sikhli to come to the fore. Part of the reason why you're able to feel things on a tinnus, on a fast day that you're not typically able to feel, is because the body, the nefesh of the body becomes weaker and weaker. You give into it much less. It's allowed much less control. The body becomes weaker and the soul becomes stronger. And a person can reach dvekas, a person can reach different levels, a person can sense the presence of Hashem to a much greater extent because the nefesh sikhli is much more able to come out and are much more able to feel things. And it's 2 o'clock, and it's 4 o'clock, when you're really feeling weak, that's the time to get to work. Because that's the time when your body is no longer obstructing you, your body is no longer that machitza, that wall that stops you, and you're now able to reach out, and that's the time to really feel the things. And that's a very key point in understanding Yom Kippur. But the bigger deal point, and this, my friends, is very central, is understanding the centrality of Limerat Torah, of learning in Judaism. Why is it that the Torah is so makbid on learning? Learning and learning and learning, and you've heard it. And since you're three years old, it's over and over, the biggest mitzvah to, to learn, you have to learn, you have to, what is the big deal? Rav Aaron used to laugh. Rav Aaron Cutler used to laugh. Mamish a laugh. He used to say, huh. There are some people actually believe there are many mitzvahs in the Torah. And learning Torah is one of the many mitzvahs. He used to laugh. Don't they understand? It's shakul keneged kulam. It's equivalent to all of the other mitzvahs. Far more potent, far more powerful. And my friends, this is the reason. Because if you'd like to understand the one spiritual superpower, the one nutrient that really gives us chiyah, strength, that is limerat Torah. The process of learning how to be chumish, mishnayas, gemara, iyun, strengthens the soul, allows the nefesh sikhli to come out. And if a person doesn't learn, if a person is not actively engaged in limit Torah, the nefesh Bahami is given full reign. All day long we eat and we're involved in all of the activities to keep the human alive. That strengthens the nefesh of Bahami all day, every day, all day long. The body, the nefesh of the body becomes stronger and stronger. The nefesh of Sikhli becomes weaker and weaker. And there is no hope. Therefore, Hashem gave us one nutrient, one super-powered fuel that allows us to really shine. That fuel is limited Torah learning. Learning allows my neshama to come out, allows my nefesh of Sikhli to become much stronger. And in the balance, the seichel becomes weaker, the, I'm sorry, the guf becomes weaker, the seichel becomes stronger. And if a person doesn't use that tool, he's in a very, very difficult strait. I think the yesod that we see from the malachim is a very, very gr- great yesod. At that moment, they desperately did not want man to have the Torah. Giving man the Torah was a risky business because the spiritual energy of the world is based on Torah. When the Malachim learned it, the world was secure. If man continues learning, great. What if he gives it up? The Malachim didn't want to allow it. Hashem said, Moshe made no answer. And Moshe's answer was quite simple. 400 years earlier, three of you Malachim ate Vas B'chalav. How could that be? Miyad Hodu, immediately. And the Malachim agreed. Why? Because that's the point. A Malach can't do anything wrong. Can it do? In theory it could. A Malach has Bechira. But its free choice is much akin to my free choice to put my hand in a fire. Just like I wouldn't do it because it's self-inflicted damage, it's dumb, so too a malach would not violate the will of Hashem. Why is it that those malachim ate? It's because it wasn't damaging to them. Why not? Because the prohibitions in the Torah are prohibitions that strengthen the nefesh of Bahami, strengthen the physicality of man, and the battle between seichel and guf, gives the guf an, un, an inordinate edge, and therefore Hashem prohibits them. And the Malachim ate. Once they understood this point, Miyad Hodu, because so many of the mitzvahs circle around this point, the mitzvahs were given to man. Man, that contradiction, that living, walking stira. The man who wants and doesn't want, the man who desires and wishes that he doesn't desire, the man who's in conflict, that's the purpose of creation. And if you wake up one morning and say to yourself, who needs this? 
I, my life would have been much better without desires and conflicts and all of this sorrows. The answer is you might be right. But understanding life means understanding that we put on this planet to grow, to accomplish, to resist, not to give in. And slowly, slowly, the more a person resists, the weaker the nefesh Bahami becomes, the more a person learns, the stronger the nefesh sikhli becomes, and in the balance of a person continues year after year, eventually he reaches great heights. But understanding this conflict, and understanding that there are two dimensions to me, helps me understand the human. Typically, it's too difficult for me to study myself, so it's a wise approach to study other people. Watch other people when they act in total contradiction. And when a guy loses his temper and says things that are the biggest bullshit to anyone, including himself. Look at him and say to yourself, what is he doing? What is he thinking? He is out of control. And when you recognize that often the human is out of control, when you see people who say, I will not touch another piece of chocolate cake ever again, five minutes later they're reaching for the cookies and the cake and everything else, and you recognize that the human has two very distinct parts, desires and a desire to control those desires. And when you study other people and you see that conflict, you see the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, then you're able to do the difficult job of pointing those eyes back at me, and you recognize that I too am comprised of two very different parts, two competing entities, and then you can begin doing the job, which we put on this planet for, growing. Understanding that every Avera strengthens the Nefesh Bahami, the Mitzvah strengthens the Nefesh Sikhli. At the end of the day, Limerat Torah is the greatest strengthening of the Sikhli of man, and without it, it's very difficult to grow. I'd like to close with a <clears throat> mushal that I think well encapsulates a particular point. But I may date myself with this mushal, so <clears throat> you'll excuse me for this. There was a time, <clears throat> and again, this may seem like ancient history, <clears throat> there was a time when you would type on your computer <clears throat> and you would have to program into the word processor to have the printer do what you wanted it to do. So for instance, <clears throat> if you were typing a paragraph, and you wanted to bold a particular letter, you would put in an open parenthesis, a B, a closed parenthesis, and that's what would appear on your screen. Your printer would know to read that as bold that word. If you wanted to underline a particular line, it would be an open parenthesis, U, closed parenthesis. And again, that's what would appear on your screen. Your printer would read that to mean underline the line. Somewhere in the mid 80s, the technology evolved and there was a process called WYSIWYG. WYSIWYG is an acronym for what you see is what you get. So now on Microsoft Word, if you <coughs> click the B and highlight over that word on the screen, you see bold. You don't see the coding behind that tells the printer to bold it. You see what you're going to get. If you underline it, you see it underlined. If you put it as color, you see it as color instantly you see what you're going to get. And I believe that that is a very apt parable for life. You see, <clears throat> right now, I stand in front of you, you can hear my words, you can judge my actions, but you don't have a clue to what's really going on in my heart. You don't know what I'm thinking, you don't know what my real motives are. You can tell by the exterior that my entire insides are hidden from you. There will come a time when you and I will leave this earth and I will be revealed for exactly what I am. What you see is what you get. When I'm stripped of this heavy cloak of physicality, when the body is buried in the ground and I separate, I meaning I who live, I who desire, I with my appetites, I with all of my emotions, I the one who tell my arms to move, when the body is buried and I separate, you will see me for exactly what I am. And that, my friends, is a very interesting thought. <clears throat> because have you ever had a thought that you were very glad no one else saw? Whether it be jealousy or arrogance, maybe desire, <clears throat> and you were very, very glad that your mind was covered with this very thick cranium, <clears throat> secluded from the world, and no one else could see your inner heart. 
Well, that is the current situation. But our desires, our thoughts, who I am is exactly who I am for eternity. If you've ever seen, there's this very cute car magnet running around town that says something about the fact that the way you think becomes the way you feel, becomes who you are forever. That message is a very powerful message because as you think becomes what you feel. What you feel is what you are forever because when the body is buried and put in the ground, I separate. But exactly what I shaped myself into, exactly what I made myself into, is what I am for eternity. And while here I'm hidden behind this cloak of a body, when I leave this body, you'll see me for exactly who I am. For many of us, it'll be very, very proud moments. But for many of us, there'll be many moments that won't be quite so proud, as in Rabbi Schaefer. Huh? Oh, I'm surprised. I didn't realize. And if you look around, and especially if you study your own life, I'm sure you'll quickly recognize that there are many things that we're engaged in, many thoughts that we have, many ambitions, many desires that we have that we wouldn't be too proud of if they were broadcast out to the world. But that moment is a part of our life. When we leave this world, you'll see me for exactly who I am. What you see is what you get. And you'll, I will be there stripped, bare, naked. You'll see me for exactly what I've shaped myself into. And understanding that while I'm here, I'm in conflict. There are different parts. The battle is very, very pitched. It's a fever-pitched battle. Because if I give in to the Nefesh Bahami, it's not just that I did a particular sin. I become much more Bahami. And that becomes me. I become desires and desires become me. I become arrogant. I become a balkas. And that's me for eternity. And on the flip side, the more I vanquish that part, the more my seichel comes out, the more I become generous, magnanimous, goodly. Being like Hashem, the more I become that. And when the game stops, when the curtain comes down, it's freeze. Exactly where you're at at the last moment of life is where you're at for eternity. And understanding that, I believe, is a very powerful motivator for us to understand the game and learn to use the tools appropriately. May Hashem give us the wisdom, understanding, and ability to put this into practice. Thank you.